Welcome back. This is Mark Rudolph, branding advisor to CEOs and author of three books on branding for CEOs. You can get these books at markrudolph.com slash books and watch all of my videos at markrudolph.tv. Today I want to talk about a very important topic. Did Elon Musk's F-bomb hurt Twitter's brand? I know he likes to call it X and he has renamed it X and I've been on the record of absolutely hating X. I still call it Twitter and most people do. Most people say X formerly known as Twitter and the reason they do that is because the name X stinks. Remember when you used to say I tweeted something? We knew exactly where you did it. But when you now say you posted something, it could be anywhere. So the point is, advertisers have bolted from Twitter X because of a two-stage process. One, there was a tweet that was out, I'll show you right here, by somebody named the artist formerly known as Eric. It says, Jewish communities have been pushing the exact kind of dialectical hatred against whites that they claim to want people to stop using against them. I'm deeply disinterested in giving the tiniest shit now about Western Jewish populations coming to the disturbing realization that those hordes of minorities that support flooding their country don't exactly like them too much. You want the truth said to your face? There it is. And Elon Musk responded, you have said the actual truth. There are Jewish organizations like the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, started in 1913, originally to combat anti-Semitism. Over the years, it has become very woke, and it has trashed a lot of white conservative groups. And that's what this guy is saying. The problem with it is, it's ambiguous. And you should never say anything ambiguous in a public forum, and you should never agree with somebody who has said something ambiguous. The, so what has happened? The fallout from this? People have accused Elon Musk of being an anti-Semite. He is anything but. And he has apologized for it. Watch. Of all the posts I've done on the platform, I think there might be 30,000 or something like that. Right. Once in a while, I will say something foolish. And I have. And I would certainly put uh, that comment um, that you said the actual truth uh, in, among perhaps one of the most foolish, if not the most foolish thing I've ever done on the platform. Um, I, I, and I did do my best to clarify uh, afterwards that, uh, you know, I, I certainly do not mean anything anti-Semitic in that. Um, the, the nature of the criticism was simply that um, the Jewish people have been persecuted for thousands of years. There is a natural affinity therefore, uh, for persecuted groups. Um, this has led to the funding of organizations that uh, essentially promote any persecuted group or any group with the perception of persecution. This includes radical Islamic groups. Uh, everyone here has seen the, the, the massive demonstrations mm -hmm. for Hamas in every major city in the West. That should be jarring. Well, a, a, a number of those organizations received funding f from prominent people in the Jewish community. Right. They didn't expect that to happen. It, it, but, but if you generically, right. w without condition, uh, sort of fund, if, if, you, if you fund persecuted groups in general, it, it, some of those persecuted groups, unfortunately, want your annihilation. And what I'm what I meant by that, when I subsequently clarified, is is that it's unwise to fu to to fund organizations that support groups that want your annihilation. Is this coming across 
My, really? Yeah. At no, it point? is. My, my question to you, though, I, is... I think is logically there, is there, this is, makes a lot of sense. Is there any part of you... I mean, just tell me what happens, <laughs> though, when once all of this happens. Let's say you fund a group, and that group supports right. Hamas, who wants you to die. Perhaps you should not fund them. Right. Okay, I'm going to show you another clip from that interview he had with Andrew Ross Sorkin. If you don't know him, he's a financial columnist with the New York Times, and he's also a co-anchor of CNBC's Squawk Box. We're talking about branding. You've heard me say this before, and I'm going to repeat it, and I'm going to repeat it, and I'm going to repeat it. What is a brand? A brand is not a product. It's not a name. It's not a company. It's not an industry. It's not a technology. It's intangible. It's an emotional connection that a customer has with a vendor or a voter with a politician. It's important to understand that. That's what a brand is. So when you hear somebody say, well, we have 100 brands on our website. No, you have 100 company names, 100 labels, but you don't have 100 brands because you can't post a brand. It's intangible. This is from my homepage. Branding is about connection, not awareness. Understand that, please. All my books talk about this, and when you hire me, I will make sure that you understand this. Let's take Tiger Woods. Here's a picture of him with the TW logo on his hat. A logo is not a brand. A logo can represent a brand, but it can never constitute a brand. Tiger Woods is probably the best golfer who ever lived. Ben Hogan, who is no longer with us, might disagree, but it's indisputable. But if you remember a few years back, Tiger got caught by his wife for having multiple affairs and allegedly she beat him in the face with a golf club. Well, at that point, his brand went from champ to chump. And now he's back to champ. Everybody loves Tiger again. It took a long time. So what changed during that process was his brand. What never changed was his logo. And I bring this to you to prove that a logo is not a brand. So if anybody in your company says we're going to rebrand because we have a new logo, that means we rebranded wrong. It doesn't mean that at all. Because if the customer's emotions haven't changed, or if they have plummeted, if they've become angry at your company, the brand has changed, but not for the better. Rebranding does not mean a new logo. A new logo does not mean rebranding. So we're going to get into what is Twitter's brand, because if what Elon Musk said hurt his company's brand, we have to know what a brand is. Media Matters, which is a left-wing bomb-throwing organization co-founded by David Brock and Hillary Clinton. Its whole purpose is to trash conservatives can trash anybody who is remotely conservative. When I was on Fox News 10 years ago, Media Matters came after me all the time. What Media Matters did was it went on to Twitter, created a phantom account, and started following major advertisers like these, the ones who bolted from Twitter. You see Oracle, IBM, Disney, Xfinity, Bravo, Walmart, Discovery, NBC, and Apple. And it started putting anti-Semitic content that it found uh, on next to these advertisers. And it made it look like, artificially, that anti-Semitic Nazi-like material was appearing right next to these advertisers. Well, then Media Matters took screenshots of this saying, see, Look at this anti-Semitic material appearing next to IBM. I think you should leave. So they did. Now, Elon Musk is suing Media Matters. Now, it's funny that IBM's on there because you may not know this, but Hitler couldn't have killed 6 million Jews without the help of IBM. Read a book by Edwin Black 
called IBM in the Holocaust. But I digress. Elon Musk, when talking to Andrew Ross Sorkin, had a message for all these advertisers who have bolted from his site, and here it is. Leaving, we talked to Bob Iger today. I hope today. they stop. You hope? Uh, don't advertise. You don't want them to advertise? No. What do you mean? If, if somebody's going to try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go fuck yourself. But go fuck yourself. <laughs> is that clear? I, I hope it is. Hey, Bob, if you're in the audience. Well, well let me ask you then. That's how I feel. Don't advertise. How do you think then about the economics of, of X? If, 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 if part of the underlying model, at least today, and maybe it needs to shift, maybe the answer is it needs to shift away from advertising. Um, if, if you believe that this is the one part of your business where you will be beholden to those who uh, have this view, G what do you do? F Y. No, how do I feel about that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm asking you personally how you feel about that because this goes, we we're talking about power and influence and-, and I'm saying, I'm saying what, I, what, what I care about is the, the reality of goodness, not the perception of it. And what I see all over the place is people who care about looking good while doing evil. Fuck them. Well, as you can see, he doesn't care because he's not gonna be held hostage to these companies. When these companies advertise, they expect to control the content. That's what they expect now. More and more people are joining Twitter X and that's where the audience is. So they can't stay away too long. Here's Tucker Carlson on the All In podcast explaining how the news business works regarding advertising, especially Big Pharma, which on TV purchases 75% of the advertising. Go. Did you ever have moments where somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, advertiser XYZ is getting uncomfortable or we're trying to land this new advertiser and right. they want you to shape things in one room. Did you ever feel that pressure? Is that, or is that just a thing that is kind of like a boogeyman that doesn't actually exist? Oh, it, well, it, it not only exists, it defines news coverage, especially hmm. on pharma. You know, because pharma is the biggest advertiser in television, as I know you know. And so for sure, I mean, if, you know, Pfizer is sponsoring your show, you're not going to question the vax. I mean, it's kind of that simple. Uh, so absolutely. And of course, that's why they're the biggest advertiser, so they can shape news coverage. I mean, that's, that's the point. Now, as you know, Fox News fired Tucker Carlson, presumably because he was attacking Pfizer all the time. Tucker was against the vaccine, and Far Big Pharma didn't like that. And Big Pharma, which buys 75% of the advertising, made it very clear, you have to get rid of this guy. Also because Tucker shared views about January 6th, which he thought was a big joke, as do I, as do millions of Americans. And he was against the war in Ukraine. We've not seen any accountability for the spending over there. And Ukraine is not winning the war. So people have a right to say, why are we there? Why are we spending the money? Well, a lot of people at Fox News didn't like that either. The whole point is advertisers control the news, but not at Twitter slash X. Now, Greg Gutfeld put his career on the line by defending Elon Musk and also Tucker Carlson. I'm surprised he's still there. Watch this. How insane is it that companies are trying to blackmail the world's richest man with money? That's like extorting Jerry Nadler with salad. <laughs> or blackmailing sports fans by threatening to cancel PBS. The fact is, Musk may be the last man standing between real freedom of speech and the suffocating block of the censorship industrial complex, which is made up of government, media, and tech forces. He realizes that advertisers have no spine and can be easily cowed by special interest groups in cahoots with political allies. If you don't believe me, I got two words for you. Tucker Carlson.
<laughs> now, I have to address this accusation against Elon Musk about anti-Semitism. You notice that when he's on, the, on this video, he's wearing this dog tag, which says, bring them home now, in both Hebrew and English. He got this dog tag from one of the families of the hostages while he was recently in Israel. And he has said he's not going to take it off until all the hostages are freed. The post that I showed you before, he has apologized for ag agreeing with that post. He realizes it was a mistake and he's man enough to say so. He made it clear he's not an anti-Semite at all. He calls himself a philo-Semite, which means somebody who loves the Jews. And he is completely aware of Jewish history. And he agreed that he never should have agreed to this post. It was a mistake. And he's man enough to say so. So in conclusion, did his F-bomb hurt his company? Perhaps temporarily, but not permanently because the audience is on Twitter. What is his brand? What is the brand of Twitter slash X? It's freedom. I would not be able to post the video I'm making today or the half a dozen videos I've made about Israel on Twitter under previous ownership. Never would have happened. Never. But because of Elon Musk, I can post this video and a lot of other videos I've put on there which criticize the current regime in Washington. And that's the beauty of Twitter under Elon Musk's ownership. So I think he made it stronger by standing up to the bullies and saying, you're not going to bribe me. You're not going to force me to change the way I run my company. I do not believe that in the long run he has hurt his company's brand, which is freedom, by publicly stating what he did in the way he did it, the GFY. And by the way, I have a message for anybody who doesn't like me being pro-Israel and being Jewish. GFY. This is Mark Rudov at markrudov.com. Until next time.